uh, warm welcomes uh, to everyone to the sixth and last uh, session of our uh, SIAM uh, Mathematics of Data Science tutorial on the foundations uh, of deep learning. Uh, today uh, we have uh, Lexing Ying uh, from uh, from the from Stanford University as our speaker. And so before I hand over the word to Lexing, uh, I'll just say a few words uh, about uh, him and his research. So Lexing is a professor of mathematics at Stanford, where he's also a member of the Institute for Computational and Mathematical Engineering. He specializes in scientific computing and numerical analysis, in particular in the design of numerical algorithms for problems in scientific computing, in particular PDEs uh, and inverse problems. Lexing received his bachelor's degree in computer science and applied mathematics from Shanghai Jiantong University, after which he moved to the Courant Institute, where he received his PhD in 2004. Before joining Stanford in 2012, he was a postdoc at Caltech and a professor at, Uni at the University of Texas at Austin. Lexing has received numerous research awards, uh, including a Sloan Fe Fellowship in 2007, an NSF Career Award in 2009, the Feng Kang Prize of Scientific Computing from the Chinese Academy of Sciences in 2011, the Cyan James H. Wilkinson Prize in Numerical Analysis and Scientific Computing in 2013. Uh, and here I might quote uh, the award um, notification, which said for his outstanding contributions in many areas, including the rapid evaluation of oscillatory integral transforms, high frequency wave propagation, and the computation of electron structure in metallic systems. And he also recently, in 2016, received the Morningside Medal. So in the last couple of years, Lexing got uh, very interested in developing machine learning, in particular deep learning approaches for solving inverse problems and PDEs. Um, uh, and in particular, in a way that despite using a, a, a black box like deep learning, uh, he can still provide mathematical guarantees and uh, designs methods that respect the physical model. Um, so I really look forward to your presentation, Lexing, um, which is uh, about solving inverse problems with deep learning. Uh, and before I hand the word over to you, I just would like to remind everyone that if uh, you are uh, interested in asking a question, then please raise your electronic hand. Uh, ideally, uh, we would like to have all the questions at the end of the talk, but if there is a very urgent one, I'm trying to stop Lexing um, uh, in between and you can ask your question. Once you raised your hand, we will unmute you and you can ask the question yourself. Okay, so Lexing, are you happy for me to hand over to you? Sure. Super, thanks a lot. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Carola, for the for the nice introduction, and uh, and also for the organized Carola and also Zan for the uh, organizing this minute tutorial. So uh, today I'm going to share with you some recent work on uh, solving inverse problem with deep learning, and uh, I, I would like to mention that I'm I'm not an expert in the inverse problem and not expert in deep learning, uh, but just trying to see that whether this new tool deep learning can uh, can can be useful in helping solving some of the uh, long-standing inverse problems and some of the important inverse, problem, inverse problems. Okay, so let's get started. All right, so uh, what is the inverse problem? Well, inverse problem is very common in uh, modern scientific computing and also um, mathematical research and also uh, in our daily life. So it's really is, is the science of in, discovering internal structure from boundary conditions through various kind, kind of physics modalities, like waves and heat and uh, those things. So uh, some of the examples I'm going to talk about today, uh, um, later in this part of the talk, is uh, radar imaging, uh, electric impedance tomography in medicines, and also uh, uh, travel time tomography. And here I just give you three pictures, which are to give you an idea about the common setup for inverse problems. So on the left hand side, you have the radar imaging, and then the middle one is a seismic imaging over the ocean survey, and finally, there's a, there's a picture for the impedance tomography. 
So the goal of the inverse problem uh, mathematics, uh, well, inverse problem more complicated and also uh, appear in different ways and different forms. But mathematically, in the common theme is that it's trying to uh, figure out uh, an internal parameter eta, which I highlighted in red here, from some kind of boundary measurement data. Okay, I will make it more precise later. But that's the main idea is that you want to know a quantity eta inside the domain where through the measurement which appear usually only on the boundary of the domain. Uh, so inverse problems, some of the inverse problems are easy, relatively easy, like for example, radon transforms, but many inverse problems are hard uh, due to nonlinearity because of the dependence between the media property eta and also the boundary data d is nonlinear. And also um, often the uh, boundary data d and also and also the internal parameter eta uh, are, are fields rather than just a scalar or short vector functions. So therefore you're really, in many cases, you know, talking about the map between two fields. Therefore the map itself is, is inherently highly environment. Now, uh, what is deep learning? So uh, deep learning is something which has get very popular in the past 10 years, and by now it's, it's yeah, near close to 10 years. So it's, it's the key ingredient, sorry, ingredients of deep learning are, are, are the following. So the most important thing of deep learning is a, is, is a structure called a deep neural network. By now, I think everyone is familiar with that. Uh, it's, it's really a very flexible way to represent high dimensional functions and high dimensional probabilities. Okay. And um, um, other things which helps quite a lot for the success of deep learning is that this structure kind of allows you to uh, do automatic feature extraction. So compared to traditional machine learning methods where in many cases people have to engineer features into the architecture by themselves, by hand, but here um, somehow um, this hierarchical architecture or layered architecture allows you to learn the features, especially through the first few layers. And, uh, and other things which, quite, uh, which, which also contribute tremendously to the success of deep learning include efficient algorithm like a stochastic gradient descent method, which is very simple, uh, but is extremely powerful. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we are yet to understand uh, all the details and mathematical structure of the stochastic gradient descent and why it makes uh, deep learning optimize it. Why does, uh, does, op why does it optimize the deep learning uh, problem so efficiently? And at the same time, we should not forget about the software packages like TensorFlow and PyTorch really um, and also hardware support like GPUs and GPUs really make it uh, make the deep learning training and inference very efficient on modern technology architectures. Now in this talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my recent work on um, try to use deep learning to solve inverse problems. And so more precisely what I mean by that is I'm trying to use a, a deep neural network to represent the inverse maps okay, for the deep learning problems. So obviously there are several challenges here. So the first thing is that well, in inverse problem, usually the amount of data we have is quite limited compared to traditional reinforced learning problems. So in traditional reinforced learning problems, oh, sorry, supervised learning problems. So in traditional supervised learning problems, uh, like image uh, classification and things like that, you have large database where you can collect it um, from the internet, for example, uh, like ImageNet. Uh, but in the inverse problem setting, uh, getting data is usually quite hard, either due to the fact that uh, getting data is expensive or due to various kind of like uh, privacy reasons. So uh, the amount of data we have are not in a certain size of data set is not in the size of millions, but typically in the size of hundreds of thousands or maybe tens of thousands. The second main challenge is that we often face with a regression problem rather than a classification problem because we're trying to find out what is our internal parameter field uh, eta, okay? So the plan uh, for our approach is that we're trying to leverage mathematics and physics to in the design of new neural network architecture modules. So two of the examples I'm gonna talk about today is uh, pseudo differential operators and also Fourier integral operators. So pseudo differential operator appears quite very often in, for example, in lectures in Peden tomography problems. The Fourier integral operators are really the working horse of uh, many uh, wave-based inverse problems. So our overall approach is to, based on these, uh, the, the nature of the inverse problem, 
we're gonna assemble a specific neural network for that based on these uh, using these new modules I'm gonna talk about, and then we're gonna train the uh, train the train the neural network weights using our uh, training data from end to end. And here is quite important, and I, I believe it, that one of the main success of a neural network is really um, you train the whole neural network end to end, so therefore the error from different components can compensate rather than uh, aggregate. So uh, the main advantage of this approach is that uh, we have a rather seamless integration of both the physics and the math of the inverse problem itself, and also the data that has been collected. And this will allow us to uh, train, address some of the inverse problem with relatively small data size and, uh, and get fairly reasonable results. So um, three applications I'm gonna talk about uh, after I present these neural network modules are Rate imaging, electron impedance tomography, and the travel time tomography. Okay. So the outline of the rest of the talk is two parts, and one is uh, I'm going to talk about new modules, and second, um, after that, I'm going to talk about some applications. So new modules. So uh, so if you take a look at interesting thing is that if you take a look at the famous neural network modules, and um, inevitably there's always a mathematical structure behind these modules. For example, if you take a look at a fully connected neutral, neural network layer, so obviously, um, if you put the nonlinearity aside, which is very important, but the fully connectedness is really represents a uh, dense operator, okay? So if you take a look at the convolution neural network and um, uh, the mathematical object behind it is a translation invariant local operators, the convolutions, okay? And if you take a look current in neural network, then it's fair to say that it's also, to a certain extent, it's motivated by the Markov chain. And finally, for the residual neural network, which has gained a lot of attention in the past uh, three or four, maybe by now it's, yeah, three or four years. So it's, it's, the idea behind it is an ODE and a time stepping and semi-group, okay? So in fact, there's a recent version of a neural ODE, which is essentially pushing this uh, residual neural network back into the uh, continuous domain. So in, in this talk, we're gonna ask uh, the question the other way, is that uh, suppose now we know that uh, if in inverse problems, the pseudo differential operator and also Fourier integral operator play a big role. So as I said, the pseudo differential operator uh, is one of the main examples pseudo differential operator is a normal operator in this problem. And uh, um, for examples of the Fourier integral operators are forward and backward, and also the adjoint operator of the wave propagation, for example. So if, if we know that these operators are gonna play big role in inverse problems and also mathematical analysis in general, what would be the uh, corresponding neural networks? Okay. So these are, the first, these are the first two questions we're gonna answer. So let's take a look at the pseudo differential operator to get a, few, uh, get a little bit of motivation about uh, what kind of architecture it corresponds to. So here I'm writing down the two forms of the pseudo differential operator. One is using the kernel form and the other using the symbol form. Okay, this K here is typically called a kernel, and A is called a symbol. So pseudo differential operators are very, uh, that, uh, contains a lot of uh, operators, which we you know, work with in scientific computing and uh, computational mathematics. So uh, they include elliptic operators, uh, Green's functions of elliptic operators, and normal operator from inverse problems. So these are designed to be generalization of the uh, differential operators. And a very, one very important property is that uh, it's keep the locality so singularity near the diagonal of the operator. So mathematically, what it means is that, at least um, from, from a numerical linear algebra point of view, what it means is that if you view this operator as a matrix, if you discretize, and then the off-diagonal blocks, the singularity only appear along the diagonal, and the off-diagonal blocks are usually numerically low rank. So therefore the plan of this talk, uh, that our approach is that we'll try to see whether we can represent the pseudo differential operator in a data sparse and a compact way. And then, and hopefully, uh, this data sparse and compact way can be represented as a neural network. And uh, based on top of that, we're gonna also insert the nonlinearities and various kind of, for example, ReLU and also hyperbolic tangent direct activation functions to make it to generalize to nonlinear case, okay? So the first part has a well-founded mathematical work behind it. The second part is more like, um, uh, we're just trying to see what we can do by generalizing this architecture. So there are two ways to uh, represent pseudo differential operators. They're related, but, uh, but conceptually they are slightly different. 
One way is using Wavelet transform uh, in the non-standard form, and this is something I'm going to talk about uh, today. And the other way, which we also followed, is using this uh, fast multiple methods and hierarchical matrices. And we also have worked a bit on that as well, but today, due to the time limitation, I'm not going to be able to go into the details. So let's just take a look quickly at the Wavelet approach. So uh, the method I'm going to talk about here is, is based on the famous paper um, by uh, Greg Belkin, uh, Rafi Koifman, and also uh, Vladimir Rockling. And historically, this has been called the BCR approach. Okay. So essentially, it's trying to take a two-to differential operator A, and we're trying to represent it in the so-called non-standard form. So the, re uh, the non-standard refers to the fact that we're going to have a uh, compressed, we're, we're going to have a sparse form of the matrix, uh, not just in terms of the wavelet coefficient, but in terms of both the wavelet coefficient and also the scaling function coefficients at all scales. So essentially, this picture is trying to give you a rough idea about how this uh, decomposition or this wavelet representation. So instead of just trying to represent this, here, as I said, we're going to augment our basis into wavelet function and scaling functions. So if you take a look at the first matrix right here, so sorry, the first matrix on the right-hand side, the, 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 the fat matrix, and the first part of it is going to contain the wavelet coefficient at the final scale. And then it's going to contain the scaling coefficient on the final scale, and so on and so forth. Because I include both the wavelet and scaling functions, so the dimension of this transform, this redundant transform, is going to be twice as large. So that's why you see that in the middle you have the matrix, which is twice as large in size. But the advantage of this transform is two things. And first, it gives you the so-called optimal sparsity. So by doing that, you see that the middle, the middle matrix itself here has only all or the n, where n is the dimension of this matrix, non-zero entries. So at every scale, and the non-zero entries is a very sim simple pattern. It's really, for example, if you take a look at the top left corner of the middle matrix on the right-hand side, it really only have three thin banded diagonal structures at the first three blocks within that big block. And the, the remaining was empty. And then you really have this hierarchical structure, which is the same pattern appeared on every level. So now, uh, in fact, what we can do is that we can actually represent this, uh, uh, this matrix in this uh, non-standard wavelet form into a neural network. So here, what I showed you the how to represent the motive vec of this operator on the right-hand side with a vector as a neural network. So here, I'm only showing you this at one single layer scales. So I'm, I'm choosing the finer scale here. So you have this, I don't have the, I, don't, I can't draw on my Mac, so I apologize for that. But this, is, this picture is really trying to show you that if you apply the finest uh, wavelet and also scaling, form transform, scaling function transform to this input vector, what, is it, what does this operation carry out? How does this carry out? It really does this wavelet, one single layer wavelet transform and trying to decompose things in as a wavelet coefficient and, and also scaling function coefficient multiply this matrix in the middle. This is like a very sparse matrix, two by two block matrix. And finally, since it's using one scale, we'll be transformed to synthesize everything back. Now, it's not hard to see that because of these wavelet coefficients and mask translation invariant, so this operation itself can be written as this following, this small figure on the right-hand side, is that you can take your input vector, do a convolution with two output channels to perform the wavelet and scaling function and then um, do another convolution to apply this operating in the wavelet basis, and then finally synthesize it back. So it's a really a three-layer convolution neural network. However, this only does not work for one single scales. So if you want to put all the scale together, you have this hierarchical neural network structure, and which essentially this down pass from the top in the first figure, and the down pass is doing the wavelet transform, the upper pass is doing the wavelet synthesis, and the middle lines, convolution lines, are really doing this, uh, this, the convolution in the wavelet basis at all scales. Now we can generalize this architecture <coughs> to make it more powerful by adding more uh, internal convolution layers and also adding nonlinearities like RALUS. And this will be resulting in our neural network architecture, which is called BCRNet. Okay. So this is the architecture we're going to use to represent uh, pseudo differential operators. 
So we can also, let's talk, also talk, talk a little bit about the uh, Fourier integral operators. So the Fourier integral operator is written in this form. It's uh, typically it's written in the simple form. It's much more convenient. Uh, compared to the pseudo differential operators, not only it has a symbol A here, but it also have this, uh, uh, this function called phi. This is called phase function, okay? So if you take the phase function phi to be x dot C, and this will go back to the pseudo differential operator, but in this case, it's, it's, but if you make phi to be more general, you'll be able to represent more complicated operators, more general operators. So it has been used quite a lot in wave propagation and in general hyperbolic systems. So, um, so it's unlike the pseudo differential operators, it's gonna be able to move the singularity around because for example, if you take a look at the evolution of the wave equation, a singularity can propagate to two different places rather stay at one place, right? So um, from the numerical linear algebra point of view, so there is a way to compress this uh, uh, Fourier integral operator if it's a large Fourier integral operator. So the idea is, is that this square root size blocks, I'm, I'm writing down here, but next, next slide I will have a picture to illustrate that. So the square root size blocks of the pseudo of the Fourier integral operators are actually numerically compressible. Okay. So the idea is the following: is that we're going to use this use this square root uh, size idea to try to represent my Fourier integral operator in a very sparse and compact way, and write this as neural network, and also try to generalize to nonlinear cases. Okay. So let me show you the picture. What do I mean by the square root size of blocks are compressible? So here I'm showing you uh, n by n size Fourier integral operator A uh, after we do the discretization, okay? So the detail of the discretization uh, does not really matter too much here and, uh, and does not impact the low rankness of these blocks. So here I show you a matrix of size maybe 16 by 16. So I, I partition them and you can do the hierarchical but here I'm only showing you one layer. You partition them into square root n by square root n blocks. So each of the block in this example will be four by four. Now each of the four by four block will actually be numerically compressible. So it can be written as a tall skinny matrix times a small matrix times a fat matrix for each of these blocks. So this is what I mean by, by showing the second picture here. So now one can actually reorganize this, uh, this, this uh, low rank decomposition because I do it a block by block. It doesn't look very much like a matrix factorization. But in fact, you can write as a product of three matrices. Well, the first matrix itself is a block diagonal matrix, where it's gonna collect all these uh, columns of these uh, block factorizations. You collect them together. And the last matrix are collecting the row matrices. So the fat matrices of these uh, block factorizations. And finally, in the middle, you have a matrix, which is extremely sparse. So it's a 16 by 16 matrix but it only has 16 entries here. So it's really the complexity of the middle matrix or the n, rather n square or n. It's just all n, it's linear inside the n. But what this matrix does is something fairly interesting. It's really a permutation between the certain entries. It looks quite complicated. Uh, well, not super complicated. It looks, but it's, it, it's much easier to understand the middle matrix if you think about um, the, 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 the 16 degree freedom, not as a vector, but as a six by, sorry, as a four by four matrix. So if you think about all your degree freedom as a four by four matrix, then the middle matrix, what it, the operator, what it does here is really flip the rows and the columns of this four by four matrix. So it's a switch between the row and the columns if you reshuffle your input vector. Okay, it's a switch operation. So now, so once we observe that this, um, uh, the impact of uh, this uh, Fourier integral operator can approximately represent it as a product of the three matrices, it's not hard to show that you can actually write this as a product of the, you, again, using convolution and also transposes. So the first operator is, evol is involving, uh, is, it can be represented by a convolution, but with square root, of channel, square root of n channels. So the middle operator, as we said, is, is really uh, a flip along the two uh, dimensions if you view the input vector as a matrix rather than a vector. So it's a square root n by square root n matrix. So it's just really a transpose operator. And then finally, you also have the convolution, but you're turning the square root of the channels back to this long vector, okay? So the whole thing is really at the convolution and the transpose and the convolution. And to make it a little more general, uh, we, what we do is simply in, inverting, inserting a few more extra convolution, 2D convolution operator in the middle 
and also add a little value. So this part of the generalization is purely empirical and it's turned out to work very well in many of the applications, but at this point there's no theory uh, about uh, what is the representation power of such a structure. So as we see that one of the unique uh, features of this architecture or this algorithm is this transpose or the switch operation uh, in the middle. So therefore we call the switch net. Okay, and this is what we're going to use to represent the Fourier integral operators. Okay, now let's move to the second part of the talk. I'm going to talk a bit about applications. Okay, so so here uh, we're going to talk about uh, three examples in inverse problem theory. Uh, one is from the radar imaging, and the second problem is from the electric impedance tomography, and final problem is is from travel time tomography. So you see that uh, because the three problems are a little bit different and the architecture we use for them, and also the, 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 the pre and post processing that we, op, we, 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 we carry out for them is a slight, a, a quite slightly different. Okay. But the overarching, uh, overarching uh, structure for each of the same, we're gonna, sorry for the table here, so we're gonna design a network architecture for each of the inverse map, for inverse map of each of these applications. So this is, uh, to a certain extent, motivated by the perturbation analysis and also the feedback projection algorithm. These are two very simple ideas in inverse problems. So once we decide the neural network architecture, and what we're going to do is that we're going to train the neural network weights end to end from the data, okay? using the data, using the training data. And finally, the resulting neural network with the trained weights are going to be used for the inference and the prediction. So before I dive into the details, and I want to mention that in the past few years, there's a lot of many, many different ways people uh, have, uh, uh, the papers appeared that people using uh, deep neural networks solving these problems. So due to the time limitation, I'm not gonna be able to uh, go into, uh, to, to, to do a justice explain what, they, what has been appearing in these papers. But I just want to, um, uh, I mean, if you're interested, you should take a look at these work. They all, I mean, their approach is slightly different from ours, but, but each approach has its merits and, uh, and also including ours has its disadvantages. So um, there are certainly many, many papers I didn't list it here, so I apologize to the authors. Okay. So the first application I, 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 I talk about, I'm gonna talk about it, is this radar imaging. This is a joint work with uh, my previous postdoc, Yu Hao Kuo, who's currently a faculty member at the University of Chicago. <laughs> So uh, the problem we're considering here is a simplified version. It's instead of a radar imaging, is we just use acoustics to uh, and Hamilton's equations uh, to work with a scalar function rather than vector functions. So uh, the total field in such a scalar scattering setting is, is, is satisfies the so-called Hamilton's equation. So for those of you who work with imaging and should be quite familiar, so this is really the Laplace minus Laplacian operator minus the omega square over c square. So what is omega square? Uh, omega is the, the time frequency, the frequency of the incoming wave that you send it to your uh, unknown domain. And Cx is the unknown sound speed that we're trying to recover, okay? So the total field Ux, it has two parts. Uh, the one part is this, the first part is this, um, this, is, this, uh, is this I, and the second part is this U sub S. So the Is is really the incoming wave field which at a specific direction. So I'm sending in the incoming wave, it's a plane wave at the direction S. And then after it interacts with the material and it's gonna scatter to various directions. So here's, for example, shows you that it's scattered to direction R. And the whole scattered field is denoted by the US, okay? So in radar imaging and also most of the acoustic imaging uh, uh, settings, it's reasonable to assume that there's a C0, which is a background velocity, which is already known. So often it's a take to be a constant. So therefore, uh, trying to recover this unknown Cx is the same as trying to recover this eta, which is really a shifted version by removing the constant background, okay? So, uh, so what are the data? Well, the data is that for each of the outgoing direction, what I can do is that I can take a look at it, my scattered field, but not at a specific location, finite distance location, but trying to look at what is the limit of this at infinity and appropriately rescale the signal of the scattered field. 
So in, 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 this is a, a quantity which is called a far field pattern in inverse problem, the wave based inverse problem, which has been very useful. And this is a good approximation about what we can record. And, and, uh, and this is our data D. So data D is a scattering pattern um, and at, 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 at sufficiently far away distance. And you see that the data has been parameterized by two numbers, two parameters. One is S, which is the incoming direction, and the other is R, which is the receiver direction, okay? So the input, uh, so therefore the inverse problem is that the take the D, which is a two dimensional function as an input, and try to figure out what is the interior property. So the way we approach the problem is to consider the first the forward problem, okay? So assuming that we know eta, and how is the D depend on eta? Well, in fact, in the small linear regime, uh, you one can show that the data D depends on eta in a fairly simple way, okay? So I'm not doing the analysis here, but after one or two page analysis, you can see that up to a first order, the data D is actually depend on eta as a follow integral. So the, for fixed X and S, so it appear as a linear combination of S and R, sorry, uh, so receiver R and S, the linear combination S minus R appear in this in exponent of this integral, this, this kernel. And then it's really just take this kernel, multiply with eta X, and you do the integral over all the OX domain, and that will give you the output data DRS. Now, in fact, a close look at this, one can show that this operator A here is a Fourier integral operator from the data domain, sorry, from the spatial domain X to this data domain RS. So here on the picture on the left-hand side, it shows you the, uh, the RS domain. On the right-hand side, it shows you the X domain. So therefore, we can try to use our um, uh, square root of the n size block uh, compression strategy. And by using this switch net I just talked about, we can represent this operator A using a neural network, okay? And we also like to point out that it's typically, it's, 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 if you reverse the architecture of the neural network, it's by taking up our neural network, by taking the input, it's just reversing the order of different layers, you get an op representation of the adjoint of this operator, okay? So therefore the adjoint of this operator, A star, can also be represented using the switch net. Now, how do we go from the, a forward problem to the inverse problems? Well, so the way we, the, 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 the idea is very simple. Is that instead we're gonna using the filter projection idea. Essentially it's a regularized inverse. So if A is the operator that brings us from eta to D, then the eta itself can be solved by this using this so-called typical regularization. It's applying the adjoint of A, which is A star to the data D, and then invert it using a regularized inverse of the normal operator. Now we know that A star as A, uh, similar to A, is a Fourier integral operator. So therefore we're gonna represent it using the switch net. And if you take a look at the second matrix here, which is the inverse of the regularized normal operator, one can show that this is actually a pseudo differential operator in quite generic setting. So therefore we're gonna use it to represent it using BCR net, okay? So the idea is very simple. So we're gonna use the following architecture to, uh, which is motivated by back projection, filter back projection um, to, 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 to represent our neural network. So take my data D here, and first I apply the switch net to mimic the A star, and then I apply this BCR net to mimic the regularized inverse of the normal operator. And the output will be eta. And this neural network will be trained end to end using the data that's available to us. So again, I would like to mention that this is a purely supervised learning setting. So we assume that we do have some data, okay. All right, so here's, uh, I'm gonna show you one simple example. This is uh, this 2D example with a wave frequency omega 60, and I discretize my domain with the 60, 80 by 80 samples. So the source and receiver are sampled uniformly on a circle with about 80 points uniformly on the circle. So the eta, or the unknown field is, uh, in this case, this picture here is a few um, Gaussians, and here I showed you four different Gaussians. And I trained this whole pro well, I mean, even though, the, so it's, so, so even though I would like to mention that even though it's trained with certain Gaussians, but the, uh, but was, was, was a, here I only show you with four dots, but the, the, uh, the data set has, 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 has Gaussians of different uh, 
numbers of Gaussians in the data sets. So therefore, it's, it's more general uh, than what you've seen here in this picture. So the data set contains about, uh, about 12,000.5K thousand uh, input and output pairs. So D is uh, the data, the imaging data. Sorry, the, the boundary measurement and the eta is unknown. Uh, sorry, in the training data, it's actually known. So this is the internal material property. And we train with uh, this, use this to train our neural network. And we also use a similar number of the testing samples to test the accuracy of neural network. So uh, the relative error we get for the inverse map is roughly about 1%. And the relative error we get about the forward map, surprisingly, is a bit worse, which is about 4%. So here I showed you that the, the, on the right-hand side, I showed you the ground truth of the far field pattern, as well as this, uh, the, the, what is the e, true eta. On the left-hand side, on the top, you see the, um, uh, especially, uh, let me just focus on the right, uh, the, 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 the bottom plot. On the left-hand side, the bottom plot is what you obtain um, by, by using our neural network architecture. So after you train the neural network, you apply to the new instruction for the true pattern. And you see that uh, the two bottom plots are very similar. The error is about 1%. It's visually, you cannot distinguish the difference between them. So the second example I'm going to talk about is this uh, uh, the electric impedance tomography example. So this is a joint work with my previous postdoc, uh, uh, Yu Weifan. And so here I just um, give a very simple setting of, of the impedance tomography. So uh, the modality to use is, 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 is a heat equation. It's all rather the Laplace equation with a certain um, perturbations. So um, the operator is minus Laplacian and minus this unknown potential eta. So here I use X to denote the horizontal coordinate and Z to denote the vertical coordinate. So the eta is a function with two variables. It's a field with two variables. And then you apply to the U, which is the um, electric potential, and that has to be equal to zero. So this is the equation that governs electric impedance tomography. So, so eta is something that we want to recover. Now, how do we get the data? The way we get the data is the following, is that at every boundary point S, okay, for every fix S, I'm gonna specify one boundary data. So one boundary condition. So that bound control condition is gonna to equal to a delta function at S and zero everywhere else. So you can think about the top level surface, I'll pick, pick one point and call S and I'll put the delta source over there and everywhere else on the top level surface, I'm gonna put zero. So for simplicity, I assume that the other boundary condition on the other sides are periodic boundary condition on left and right and also zero boundary condition on the bottom. But that could be easily generalized as long as it's a rectangular domain. So, so, so we specify this boundary condition. And then, so what is the boundary data we collect? The boundary data we collect is a normal derivative of the solution generated, generated by this boundary condition at all the points R on the surface. And so therefore, our data again R is also parameterized by two parameters. One is S, the source point where we specify the delta source and R is a point that we measure the normal derivative of our solution, okay? So this operator is typically called the Dirichlet to Norman map. And in fact, the Dirichlet to Norman map is the kernel of the Dirichlet to Norman map. So the inverse problem is that we're gonna use in front of the kernel of the Dirichlet to Norman map, we're trying to figure out what is the internal parameter. So again, let's just first take a look at what is the forward problems. Uh, we always use a forward problem to try to get an idea about what does the operator look like. Well, in the linear regime, when the eta is small, so one can show that the forward, the original normal map, is actually involve a kernel which can be written down very easily using the Green's function of the operator, the Green's function G0 of the Laplacian operator without this extra perturbation. So let's just take a look at the Laplacian operator over the domain and try to figure out what is the Green's function and the normal derivative of the Green's function and multiply it together. So you see this is, is a product, it's a little bit unusual. So it's really, uh, so for every point R and S, you're gonna uh, take the Green's function at the point R and take the Green's function, normal derivative of the Green function at S and then take the product and that will give you the kernel of this forward map. 
This looks rather complicated, but in fact, you can dramatically simplify that. And there's a hidden convolution structure. So if you look at the problem in a slightly different way. So instead of looking at the output data in the receive and the source coordinate, but if you do this uh, middle point or offset coordinate transformation, so you define the data in terms of the new coordinate, M and H, where M is really the middle point is uh, R plus S over two, and H is the shift between R and S. So it's R minus S over two. So if you take a look at the data in this new shifted coordinate, and then this operator A between eta and the shifted coordinate data can be written very nicely in terms of convolution, okay? But instead of one single convolution, this is the sum of a bunch of convolutions. And this convolution, notice that the convolution itself is only in the horizontal direction. So the, so the offset, so the middle point M of the output data, D, and also the horizontal direction of your parameter eta. And this is where the direction where you have the convolution. So the offset parameter H and also the depth parameter Z appear as the parameters. So you have a bunch of the convolutions and then you add them together. So this is what the linearized operator look like in the transform domain. So now obviously one, should, one can implement this as a convolution neural network, but only in the X direction, X and M direction and using the Z and H direction as the channels of this convolution neural network. So the problem that you have quite a lot of channels. But the advantage here is that if you, this problem is really um, governed by the heat propagation, right? The, the potential electrostatic potential. So therefore, both the channel H and Z are very highly compressible. So therefore, instead of having many convolutions, 1D convolutions, you only need a small number of them. That would be sufficient, okay? Now, so therefore, uh, so let me speed up a little bit. So, so again, uh, to figure out what the inverse map is, we again use a field back projection with this technical regularization. So this A operator that we discussed on the previous slide, as we said, it can be represented by a 1D convolution neural network with multiple channels. And then this regularized inverse part, one can show that it's also a pseudo differential operator. So we're gonna represent it with the BCR net. So here gives you the overall architecture uh, for, for the inverse problem, for the inverse network for these problems. That given my data, and first I'm gonna shuffle it to represent the data in the M and H coordinate rather than the receiver source coordinate. Then I'm gonna use the compression in the H variable, so to reduce the number of channels. And then a bunch of 1D convolutions with multiple channels. And finally, and decompress in the D variable, okay? So the compression and the decompression can be really represented as uh, also as a convolution neural network with the convolution mask of size one in the spatial X direction. So all this work is in the coordinate direction, H and Z. So, and finally you feed it through the BCR net to, 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 to implement this regularizing inverse and then the result will be your internal parameter. And again, everything is trained end to end. So here I showed you an example of the reconstruction. Uh, and here, instead of specifying the measurement only on the top surface, and here we do top and bottom, so that we'll have a better resolution. So <clears throat> to just give you an idea, so we train it on a domain of size one by half, and we use 8K pairs of data for training, and also a new 8K pairs of data for testing. So in this case, the forward map has 1% of an error, which is quite good. And, but the inverse map after we train has a slightly big error, which is 8%. And this is mostly due to the fact that this problem, this inverse problem is extremely e opposed and EIT is a very e opposed inverse problem. So therefore, um, so we're not able, in fact, I, in fact, any method, none of the methods will be able to get very highly accurate reconstruction for EIT. That's it's because it's e opposed problem. So here on the right hand side, I show you two pictures. One is a ground truth internal parameter eta and the second is our reconstruction. So the error, you see that uh, it looks almost the same. So the reconstruction is quite accurate. So sorry, I'm running a bit of time, but in the remaining two minutes, what I'm gonna do is two or three minutes, I'm gonna tell you this uh, yet another <coughs> example in this problem It's called the travel time tomography. This is also joint work with, with the UA Fan. So here, the setup is the following, is that you have a circular domain. Let's consider a 2D problem, you have a circular domain. 
and you have unknown parameters inside and M, which is corresponding to the so-called slowness. So slowness is one over the uh, traveling velocity. So think about this as at a source. So think about this as like a earthquake stations, right? The round thing is just the earth. And suppose at a source point, you have an earthquake, right? And the earthquake is gonna propagate with a certain speed through the earth. And certain part is gonna propagate fast and another part is gonna propagate slow. So that's why the trajectory, trajectory the ray, tra rays of this propagation is not gonna be a straight line. Rather it's gonna, it has a curve or maybe different uh, lines a piecewise constant in this case, in this picture, okay? So, the, 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 so, so what we record at these is the blue dots are the so-called first arrival time, okay? And the first arrival time itself is satisfied this Icono equation, which is where the slowness m appear as a parameter, okay? So the unknown quantity in this equation is this m tilde, which is uh, which we call the slowness perturbation, is the true slowness m minus one, okay? Which is a constant background at one. Now, how do we, what is our data? Well, as I said, the data is really this uh, first arrival time information that we recorded at these blue dots. So it's, it's parameterized by the source S, also parameterized by the receiver R, right? and, this, and this USXR, it just denotes the first arrival time of this icon equation. And the problem is to go from D, the data we collected, the two dimensional data, to figure out what is the media slowness perturbation M tilde. So again, the structure is the same. We consider first the forward problem. So in the linear regime where M perturbation is random, M tilde perturbation is small, we can actually write the data, receiver data, D, as a convolution, as also in the convolution form. But now this convolution is, has to be in a polar coordinates because of circular geometry. Here we're leveraging the circular symmetry of my domain and also my source and receiver setup. So, so it's a convolution in the S variable. So, okay, so one thing I forgot to mention is that we also have to do a transformation of my data. So instead of in the receiver and source coordinate, I'm gonna write it as the receiver, sorry, source and offset coordinate. So offset H is defined to be R minus S. Okay, so we're sharing my data array. So in this shared <coughs> data array, then my, my output, my receiver data can be written as a convolution form of my uh, slowness, m, m tilde. And this convolution is in this S and theta, these angular variables. And both the offset variable H and also the radial direction theta, sorry, rho, is gonna appear as a parameter. So again, similar to the previous example, this can also be viewed as a bunch of 1D convolutions added together. Okay. So again, uh, for the inverse problem, uh, we, uh, we use a field back, back projection. And this A star operator, similar to this operator A, can be represented by this uh, a bunch of 1D convolution with multiple channels. And this, uh, this second part, this regularized inverse part, can be represented as a pseudo differential operator. So the first one is gonna be represented by CNNN, and the second one will be represented by, the second part will be represented by the BCR net. So when you put that together, you get the following architecture, okay? And now, uh, now let's, uh, we're gonna train this whole architecture from end to end. And here I showed you one example we obtained uh, by three using 20,000 training pairs. So here I show you 12 different plots, so uh, the top row is uh, what if we only have negative perturbations. Middle row is what we have only positive perturbation. And then the last row is what if we have both positive and negative perturbations. So the first column is the reference uh, solution. And the second column is what we have no noise. But what does our construction look like? So in travel tom time tomography and problems, I mean, typically the receiver, the data you recorded will have a, quite a bit of noise. So here we are studying how the noise is impact our reconstruct the neural network. So uh, you see that in the second column, uh, we can almost perfect construction, reconstruction. As the noise go up, eta is equal, delta is equal to 2% and delta is equal to 10%. So you see that the, the pictures get a little bit more blurry inevitably because we have noise, right? Uh, but you see the shape and also the orientation of these inclusions are well preserved, okay?
both in the negative inclusion, positive inclusion, and mixed inclusion case. So this shows that even with really quite large noise, and with 10% noise, our method is able to reconstruct the inclusions and the perturbations rather accurately. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry I'm over time, but uh, here's just a slide trying to summarize the contribution, uh, so what we have done so far. So we talk about new neural network architectures, and we talk about uh, various kind of applications, and the takeaway message is that our approach really based on seamlessly combining the mathematical physics knowledge about the inverse problem with the data. And the physics and mathematics motivates the structure of the neural network, and the data the training data is used to decide the weights of the neural network. Okay. So future work, uh, the hope, we hope that we can quantify the performance of this method. So here, so far, I mean, there's a little bit of mathematics uh, at the beginning when we motivate the architectures, a lot of, quite a bit of low rank compression schemes, but, but in terms of performance, I mean, there's not much mathematical theory, uh, mathematical analysis we can provide at this point. So it's also important to study different geometries in the inverse problems. And uh, so here we consider the full data setting, but what we only have a partial data. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank you uh, for listening to the talk. And here's a bunch of references that are relevant to, to this presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Lexing. This was great. Really, really uh, interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, let's give uh, people some time uh, to think about their questions. I already have one. <laughs> okay. Um, so can I ask you uh, again a little bit, uh, Lexing, about your switch net? Yes. So are you using this to approximate A and A star separately? Do you have two networks or are you approximating the whole filtered back projection with uh, this uh, network? Oh, no, uh, we are only using, let me just go to the radar imaging. So yeah. the A star is only used to, to okay, so here the, the whole field of projection has two parts, A star and also the regularized inverse. Right. The switch net is only used to represent A star. So the regularized inverse itself is a pseudo differential operator. So I'm using this BCR net, the wavelet based construction to approximate that. So the neural network, uh, here the second blue line is the neural network architecture. So it has two parts. The first part is the switch net to mimic. Right, so to, to compute A star D, okay. Yeah, the second, okay, I see. The, yeah, the second part of BCR is to, to compute the regularized inverse. Okay, so the relationship between the regularized inverse, meaning that there is, you know, you have a relationship between A and A star, one being the adjoint of the other, yeah. is not captured by this, right? So the, 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 your A star network uh, yeah, so I'm only using the factor that this is a pseudo differential operator. I'm not using the internal structure that this A and A star in this pseudo. Right, right. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, okay, okay. So the motivation um, is uh, that it's, it's computationally more efficient to do that because you have a model here, right? You could also yeah. think, what, what, what I was thinking is you, you, you could also, if you have already a model for the forward operator and right. for the pseudo inverse, you could also think about rather learning a correction to that than the full thing. Yes, yes, you can do that, yes. Uh, right, I mean, uh, one alter alternative way to do that is instead of just taking the whole inverse as a black box and use a pseudo differential operator BCR to represent it, you can try to erode this using Neumann expansion, for example, right? Right, what we heard right. yesterday. Yes, this is what you heard, yes. Yeah. These yeah. are the approach with other people being taken. So mm -hmm. if you do Neumann series expansion, then you will have a bunch of A's and A star appear in this expansion. And for each term, you can certainly use this for a switch net to represent A and A star. That's certainly right. doable. Right. So you, it's more like you have a recurrent neural network where every time you go back to the self and add the extra term. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so mm -hmm. one can do that as well, but 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 I guess I mean I I don't I mean it's, it will be interesting to compare which approach give you better performance. But here we kind of like take a slightly more black box approach. Say that okay, this is a pseudo. I'm gonna use whatever goes for pseudo. One network, and then I yeah. use another one for the. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So thank you for the question. We we have a question. Um, mm -hmm. The first one being from Joshua Lensford. Okay. 
Can we unmute Joshua, Ozan? Yes, can you hear me? He's yes. Unmuted. Perfect. Fantastic. Um, so my question is, so you have, it seems like, I'm not sure quite tell if you have multiple inverses. And if so, do you fit a neural network to your forward, your physical forward model, and then have another, I guess, convolutional layer for each layer of the forward network? And that convolutional layer is then your inverse? Oh, no, I, yeah, okay, I understand so your question now. So, so uh, I don't train the forward neural network at all. So I'm only using uh, the forward neural network is, in fact, there's no forward neural network here in my architecture because I only have the adjoint operator and also the regular inverse, okay? So there's no forward map. I'm not using, so the training really using D as an input and the eta as output. So, so, so I'm training the whole inverse map together. So this is whole end-to-end -end training. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. So you don't actually calculate an inverse matrix necessarily. No. So it's, just, it's just representative. Okay. Yeah. So in fact, I, 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 I have to take it back a little bit. In the example, in this example, so it's a forward map because I'm doing the results both for the inverse and forward map. So in this example, we trained the, the forward map as well, okay? Mm -hmm. By just purely just mm -hmm. using uh, the switch net. So we did that. But, but that's not the main purpose of this talk. This talk is mostly about the inverse map. So, so, so in the case of the inverse map, let's go back to the second red line here. And the inverse map architecture is this switch net plus BCR net. And I train everything together, okay? And my, my personal experience is it's very important to train the neural network, at least at, at the latest, at, at, at least at, 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 at the, towards the end of your training process to train everything end to end. And that's, that's also what everyone does, right? In the image processing and also the translation in natural language processing. This way, the error of different components can compensate rather than aggregate. So I think that's also quite important in terms of getting a good accuracy. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Lexing. So the next question is by Arati Pati. Yeah, Ar Arati, you are un you are yeah, allowed to speak now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think this is a very great uh, presentation. Uh, my question is regarding the second example for the heat equation that you talked about. So here you have the domain is uh, like a rectangular. If you think it is a circular domain, then how difficult it will be? Ah. Because uh, your kernel, uh, the Green's function, you are just finding one dimension. So, and the second question is like how difficult it is from the computational point of view to calculate a star like the adjoint. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, let, let let, let, okay, so in fact, so you, you asked a question about the circular domain. In fact, the circular domain is not so hard. Mm -hmm. In fact, the circular domain is actually the, the second easiest example because by doing a polar coordinate transformation, I can turn the circular domain into this, this, uh, this uh, rectangular configuration. Okay, so, and the, the analysis we have here uh, all works. So even in the circular domain, and this, this, this Dirichlet to Neumann map can also be written as the product of the normal derivative of the Green's functions. And uh, you can also do the, but here the, the, the difference is that um, here I, when I uh, do the middle point and offset construction, it's, 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 it's in the RNS on the top surface, but when you have the circular domain, RNS is gonna be on the boundary. So therefore, so it will also be a convolution but in the angular variable, and but the um, but 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 the edge here and the z here, edge is the the circular offset and z is the radial direction, and they will appear as the parameters. So in fact, in the circular setting, the geometry will actually the, the architecture of this will look a little bit like the third example. Okay. And now regarding your second question, how do we calculate the a star? So so if you in the so. So if you, are, you were asking about how do we calculate the A star? Numerical, numerical calculation, like Num you, are, you are keeping all these um, back thing from the time. 
Oh, sorry, uh, there's no time here. So the reason I mentioned the heat is because the Laplacian is kind of like what appear in the heat equation. Mm -hmm. but, the, but, but it is really, uh, the, the, really, the physics modality is really the electrostatic. Okay. okay. So and, how and difficult it will be if you have time? Oh, the, the, that's also a good question, is that if you have the time dependent problems, um, but I don't, so EIT, usually people don't do it in the time dependent setting. But obviously, there in many wave-based problems, you do have time-dependent setting. And this is something that we have not considered. But one way to do that is uh, if, if you really have, I mean, you can do a Fourier transforming time, for example, to get the frequency data and combine different frequencies to, together to do reconstruction. So that's certainly doable. And, uh, and if you have really, I mean, very short segment of time data, and then, I mean, maybe it's probably better to do it in the time domain. I haven't thought much about that. Thank you. Next thing then, yes. Um, so uh, maybe we can have one more question from you, Chong, and then I think we need to wrap up. You, you are allowed to speak now. Uh, thank you. So uh, thanks for the very good talk. Uh, so. Uh, Please correct me uh, if my observation is not correct. Uh, please correct me if my observation is not correct. That it seems to me that the uh, your, your inverse uh, network is uh, uh, comes from your uh, mathematical derivation of the uh, some kind of linearity of the inversion, right? Right. So we motivate the architecture design by using the perturb linear perturbation regime. Yes. Yeah, so uh, in that case, that the, the difficulty of the uh, most of the inverse problem is a uh, nonlinearity. So I would like to ask that uh, how these uh, networks uh, uh, capability or handle the nonlinearity? Yeah, it's a very good question. So there's not much we can prove here at this point. Um, so I, at first, I want to admit that it's, it's, uh, it's because um, we don't know, I mean, it's a very high dimensional nonlinear map between high dimensional data and high dimensional data. So we, yeah. I don't have a full picture about how this look like, except what happens in the linear perturbation regime, or maybe also in the quadratic regime, right? So one way to do that is you can use Neumann series expansion. But in many inverse problems, the Neumann series expansion is not going to work. For example, for the, for, for the, uh, for the hyperbolic system, uh, so for the parabolic, no, sorry, for the Helmholtz equation that we have here. The Neumann series is not, usually not, Converging. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what we so essentially my understanding the following is the following is that if you take a look at the example that we have here, so um, so so what we are really uh, so, okay. So if you take a look at it, so so maybe it's easier to take the other direction. What what, what will be the forward map going from eta back to the data? So using our methodology, what so if you take a look at the other direction of the fully nonlinear forward map. So what we're doing is really trying to mimic the whole process by putting a BCR net first and then doing a switch net. So the BCR net does is some kind of, so the word does a nonlinearity in our architecture is in these ReLUs and also nonlinear activation function in BCR and also the switch net. So this is where the nonlinearities are. So we're hoping that these nonlinearity functions can approximate the nonlinearity of our true forward inverse map. So the point I want to get to is the following is that if you take the truly nonlinear map, eta to d, so you look at the different other direction, it's a little bit easier to understand. If you take a look at the map from eta to d, so what our architecture does is do the BCR net first and then do the switch net. So what numerically we observe is that what a BCR net does is kind of like a constructing an effective media for eta. So you take the eta, but you construct an effective media eta prime which is essentially can be mapped to the data in a linear way. So in, in some sense, you're, you're taking your data eta here and you're, you're constructing, you enrich the data by inserting these, these, these non-physical uh, perturbations to get an eta prime. And so that when you apply the linearized propagation of the wave to this eta prime, that will give you the true data D. So in some sense, you said, it's, it's constructing effective media. That's how you think about this. So you have the true media eta, and the first step, the BCR net in the reverse direction will allow you to construct some effective media. And then you apply an almost linear step on this effective media to approximate the, the D. 
so in some sense, so this first step of the BCR net is doing this unrolling of the ETA to get an effective, uh, to get a nonlinear version. So I, I, I don't know whether I, I mean, so there's not, is this, this, what I'm saying here is not rigorous. This is what was reserved numerically. So for example, if we take a look at the BCR net, take a look at the, uh, the, the, the forward problem that we trained, we get, take the ETA and we take a look at the output of what, we, what if we apply BCR net to ETA. We observe that this ETA is, does not stay at an original location, but it has appeared as a several other, smeared a little bit, appeared at several other locations. So in some sense, you're trying to construct an effect media for ETA such that uh, the second part of the propagation can be linearized. Does that make sense? Mm, to some extent, but the, the problem is that really the BCR net, the structure of the BCR net, uh, the structure of the such a net can really uh, capture the nonlinearity. Well, I mean, I, I certainly agree with you. I mean, there's, as I said at the beginning, it's not, so at, at this point, I don't have any mathematical analysis to show me the, what is the representation power of the BCR net. So, uh -huh. so unfortunately, in, the, in, the, in most of the research in deep learning, and I would say most of the research, so what is the representation power of architecture is not known, right? So, and so we have many, many neural network architecture does a great job for doing image class. But there's, but, but, but at this point, there's no medical results tell us why they can be successful. And, and, and there's also this recent line research of adversarial examples where in fact can show that you can actually cook up examples where this will break down. So this is active line of research and I, I, it's, it's certainly it's extremely important, but this is not something that I can address at this point. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Lexing. Thank you very much. It was yeah. really a very Thank intriguing you. talk of how you can use, uh, you know, mathematical modeling to design uh, network architectures, to design uh, deep learning solutions to solve, uh, to solve inverse problems. I really, really liked it. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you uh, much. Thanks also to, uh, again, to all the speakers of this tutorial. Unfortunately, today, this was the last session. Uh, but uh, I, for my part, really enjoyed it. Um, Ozan, did you want to say anything in, in addition? Well, I, I just want to point out that the, the architecture seems to be a very central issue. I mean, the three talks this week have been totally centering around how to design suitable architectures for, for, that are domain adapted. And of course, the second story that is always re reoccurring when it comes to error estimates or yeah, the natural questions we usually ask, we all shrug our shoulders and, and look a bit unhappy. So <laughs> whoever comes up with a good estimate for the generalization gap in the context of inverse problems, I think will be a hero. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, nice. that's, that's, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot everyone again. And uh, as Ozan also explained yesterday, all the talks are recorded and uh, the videos will be available on the SIME YouTube channel. Um, so. Thanks a yeah. lot. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Lexing. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Richard.